Bacchus is an ancient institution. Um, it has been devised to discuss uh, key Internet policy issues um, with regard to the Internet. Um, normally, what we do is have robust debates on key Internet policy. Um, we assemble a panel of experts who debate and dis often disagree about the proper approach that Congress should take with regard to congressional policy. Today, we're not doing that. Um, today, we have more of a celebration and re retrospective of a key piece of legislation that was crafted when the in Internet was young and when the World Wide Web was embryonic. Uh, today's event is called Celebrating 15 Years of Legislation That Saved the Internet, Section 230. Um, we think it's a fairly bold statement, but we think it's quite accurate. Um, as reference, in your program today, we've published the full text of the code, Section 230, which is very similar to H.R. 1978 that was drafted in the summer of 1995 called, you know, it was titled, uh, the Internet Freedom and Family Empowerment Act. Um, it was authored principally by uh, then Representative Ron Wyden and Christopher Cox. Um, you can also, if you're online watching, you can reference, we, we tweeted this, the text of the, the statute, where you can follow the discussion at, at hashtag uh, SEC230. Um, we've assembled, assembled a panel of experts who have first-hand knowledge of uh, why the legislation was created, um, when it was created, and how it, how it has become such a powerful tool for Internet innovation, commerce, and democracy. Um, as far as, obviously, we have Senator Wyden here. He'll be introduced in just, just a moment. We, as the format goes, we'll have um, Jerry Berman introduce the senator. The senator will make some remarks. He has to rush off to votes. Uh, then we'll have a colloquy with our panelists. I will have a wireless microphone, and we can ask, we can ask questions after that. Um, in anticipation of that, let me introduce Danny Weitzner, who is the Deputy Chief Technology Policy, Policy Officer for Internet Policy in the White House. Um, Danny, Danny is on loan from NTIA to the White House. Formerly before that, he worked for the World Wide Web Consortium, which was founded by t uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, Danny was also a founder of the Center for Democracy and Technology and worked there back in 1995-96 and also, also worked for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We also have Todd Cohen, who is Vice President and Deputy General Counsel for Global Government Relations, Intellectual Property, Regulatory and Asset Protection from eBay and has a lot of experience in global Internet government affairs. Um, and to introduce the senator is my boss, Jerry Berman, uh, who happens to be the chair of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee and founder of the Center for Democracy, Center for Democracy and Technology. And in 1995-1996, helped Senator Wyden, then Representative Wyden, um, pa pass legislation, uh, H.R. 1978, that kind of led to Section 230 that we have today. Jerry? Thank you, Tim. Um, great having you here. Danny, Todd, and all of you, a lot of uh, old faces, I remember. Uh, because the senator has to run, I'm going to tell a very truncated story. My job today was to introduce Senator Wyden uh, and also tell you how 230 came about. That's really simple. Without Senator Wyden and Representative, then, uh, Representative Cox and, and Representative Wyden, we wouldn't have Section 230. It's just impossible to imagine how the Internet would have grown if indecent communication was, was um, the law of the land and intermediaries were responsible for all the content that was on their, their sites, whether it's Twitter or Facebook. You just have to try and imagine that. But that's what Congress is trying to do in the middle of rewriting the Telecommunications Act. The irony is they, when it came to the Internet, Title V, it was a footnote to the great telecommunications rewrite. They said, let's regulate it. And they were trying to protect children. There was a hubbub and big concern about pornography. Time magazine had a story. The senator had a blue book full of obscene pictures that senators would go off and look at. But they really missed the fact that this was not television. It wasn't one to many. You couldn't edit it. It was many to many communications. And that user empowerment was the way to go to empower parents and to allow intermediaries to create safe spaces for kids that act as good Samaritans but not face liability. We, try, we formed an interactive working group of 80 organizations, many of the organizations that are in this room, uh, AOL, Prodigy, uh, Progress and Freedom Foundation, CDT, um, and we tried to educate the Congress in the midst of all of this. We failed in the Senate. We got Senator Leahy to introduce a study, but the study wasn't going to deal with this tsunami. Congress never met a pornography bill that it didn't like or embrace, particularly when it came to a medium they didn't understand. 
So in the spring of 1995, we went to the House, and the interactive working group, including Danny Weitzner and Progress and Freedom Foundation and AOL and Prodigy, we went to meet with Congressman Wyman. He got it. New medium. Ought to be democratic. It shouldn't be regulated uh, by the government. Let users have control. Educate parents and let intermediaries create safe spaces without facing liability. Leahy wants, tried to study it. I remember meeting with Congressman Wyden, and he said, Jerry, why are we studying it? Let's do it. And Speaker Gingrich had said it was unconstitutional with the help of the Progress and Freedom Foundation. So we had a new Republican Congress interested in decentralized, voluntary, market-driven solutions, and we had a leader who is a bipartisan genius at putting legislation together and how to go and get Republicans and Democrats together and do something. So with us educating and bringing tools and dem doing demonstrations, Congressman Wyden, we worked the draft this statute, and we got Section 230. I can, after you tell your story, I'll tell you how we had to go through the final act of the Supreme Court. But you take us through that House story. Oh, Jerry, thank you. What, what an inflationary introduction. And <laughs> this really does seem almost like, uh, you know, kind of a family reunion to have Jerry and, and Danny in, in, in particular. It's not just Section 230, folks. I mean, the net would not be what it is today if it wasn't for these two and the, and the center. I want to thank them. And, and Todd, a more recent uh, a friend, also given us lots of good advice. Glad you're on the, on the panel. And uh, it's, it's very hard to kind of recreate you know, all of this, and Jerry did some very good and, and kind of snappy work of kind of summarizing it. I remember shortly after we got into this and we had prevailed in the Supreme Court, my older daughter, who was then in high school, uh, reacted to a story that my staff was passing on. I had just been named one of the most tech-savvy members of the United States Congress. And David Sohn even probably remembers this being in our office later. And boy, was I puffed up about myself. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I said, this is just great news. All of this exciting, you know, te technology. And my high school age daughter heard about this, and she just started laughing and couldn't, you know, stop. She was practically purple with the thought of it. And she said, Dad, how can this possibly be? You send a couple of emails, you know, to people and things like, you're one of the most tech-savvy, you know, members of Congress. And she rolled her eyes and she says, I can't even guess what the others are like. <laughs> and part of what's happened, and, you know, all of this has changed very dramatically, of course, in the <clears throat> period since now almost, you know, two decades since the early 1990s now, you know, members of Congress have to have smartphones and tweet and the like just to sort of keep up with family and, and, uh, and friends. We have different challenges today in terms of Internet policy, and some of you know what we're up to in terms of protect IP and other issues that I know you all feel, feel strongly uh, about. But back then, you really did have to spend an enormous amount of time trying to lay out, for example, one of the points Jerry was talking about was how the net was different than uh, television because people really didn't know a, a, a lot about it and would just say, oh, the net seems to just be another kind of wire. And so we'd spend a lot of time trying to lay out how it wasn't just uh, another wire through which consumers receive uh, content. It was a network in which everybody could create and, uh, and consume uh, content. And in effect, when you're in that kind of discussion, you're trying to describe what you do with a young ecosystem. And it was all about, in those kind of days of infancy, trying to get it right with respect to regulation, taxation, and the kind of flip side of avoiding, you know, unnecessary uh, litigation. Now, my colleague in all this was Congressman Chris Cox, Representative Chris Cox, who would proudly tell you that he is one of the most conservative, really libertarian uh, public uh, officials uh, who served. And he and I sat down and said, look, this is pretty simple. 
this is basically going to be about freedom and innovation. This is what it's all about. And, folks, it's never really changed. We had a news conference yesterday to look back at the electronic privacy law. Some of you are here, Senator Mark Kirk and, and myself. Pretty much the same principles were at stake there. And because smart decisions were made back then by Jerry and Danny, you know, in, in particular, we didn't mess up the platform. We didn't mess up the platform. And out of this, there is still a reason why so many of the exciting innovations and products and services have been developed in the United States. So this work was extraordinarily you know, important. And I can only imagine what it would have been like over the last 15 years if the Senate position rather than the House position and what eventually became Section 230 hadn't prevailed. The position that the Senate set out would have established liability on all the Internet intermediaries for the Internet content that their network facilitated. So, in effect, this was the first major legislative approach, the approach taken in the United States uh, Senate, to, in effect, sanitize and censor content deemed as objectionable. And so you had everybody all upset. As Jerry mentioned, a Time Magazine article, smut, who was going to possibly be in favor of smut in America. I certainly am not in favor of, of smut, but we all tried to say, folks, you're not going to be able to sterilize you know, the Internet. And we started, and Jerry and Danny in particular, at one point I remember a discussion where we asked Chris Cox and I about how many people it would even take to try to implement the Senate legislation. I mean, would you just have a gazillion people all kind of, you know, reading websites and, and, and the like? It just, it just struck us as implausible and something that could really chill both innovation and, uh, and freedom. So as Jerry uh, touched on with his good counsel and, and Danny's, and, and boy, it, it really was a, a campaign during those days because we would have meeting after meeting and and Jerry and, and Danny pretty much almost had a post office box up on the hill just trying to, you know, make sure that uh, if you had to use snail mail, you could get in uh, touch with them. And I think that the principles that we laid out in, in the House, that the net is a tool for democratizing power and empowering individual users – who would individually manage their online uh, content that comes into their homes and, and, and businesses has still been the guiding principle. You didn't need to sanitize uh, the Internet. What you needed to do was make sure that parents and families uh, had the technological tools to filter out the junk, the garbage they don't want their kids uh, to see. So our bill was H.R. 1978, and it was attached as an amendment to the Telecommunications Act that moved through the Senate. But the Senate approach was also attached. So you had these two kind of contradictory approaches uh, to uh, this issue and um, the Internet. And I think uh, uh, Jerry and Danny and your, this panel, uh, Todd, everybody's going to walk through some of that uh, history in terms of how the courts, you know, dealt with it. But our approach prevailed in the courts, and that's why Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act stands today. It is, in my view, the first of a set of principles that started marching us in the right direction. And the march continues to this day. David was very involved in, in our office in the Internet Tax Freedom Bill, try to limit discriminatory uh, approaches in terms of taxation. We talked about that at Web you know, 2.0. I mean, why would you have a discriminatory regime for digital goods? Why would you, in effect, say that iTunes are going to be treated differently than a physical good? You know, the, the idea of a, of a CD. It doesn't make any sense. And this march over the last kind of 15 to 20 years to try to set up a, a uh, innovation and freedom-friendly approach to the net 
continues uh, as we uh, discuss these issues today in the Congress. We've been able to protect the network effect from this kind of smothering approach of, of people who were, you know, well-meaning. But that fight that we won really began in the mid-1990s uh, uh, is one that is going to continue uh, to, this, uh, to this day. The other point I, I want to, you know, mention is we – kind of enjoy Twitter and YouTube and Facebook and all of these platforms for speech and, and, and commerce that I think to a great extent has flourished because of the good work that these folks did and, and the fact that we were able to uh, get Section 230 uh, in, into law is going to continue in a variety of, of other kind, kinds of forums to be a major uh, source of debate. I chair the Senate Finance Subcommittee on International Trade. Picture what we did on these kinds of subcommittees 15 to 20 years ago. We would be talking in those subcommittees almost exclusively about barges. We'd be talking about duties. We'd be talking about heavy industry moving products from point A to point B. And I don't take a back seat to anybody in terms of fighting for those industries today. They are very, very important. We need a traditional manufacturing base in this country. And I'm not going to take a back seat to fighting for those industries uh, in the future. But what we also know is that the Internet is going to be the shipping lane of the 21st century. And we had a hearing in the Senate Finance Subcommittee on Trade uh, a couple of months ago that is remarkably different than the kinds of hearings you would have about international trade 15 to 20 years ago. We were talking about cloud computing and what are going to be the possibilities for all these goods and services in the digital space. And boy, the American economy needs them now more than ever because of the chance to make good wages and support a family by having the kinds of jobs that the digital uh, economy uh, offers. So as the Internet grows as something we look at as the shipping lane of the uh, 21st century, a, a central platform for commerce and, and a means by which uh, people and societies uh, organize, recognize that the history you're going to hear about today and Section 230, in my view, had these good folks not been successful and worked with a bunch of us in the Congress, big group of stake, stakeholders, I don't think we would have the foundation on which we're building today. I don't think we would have the number of jobs in the digital economy uh, we have today. Everywhere I go, I say, I don't want to be somebody who either gets the net wrong and talks about how it's like a series of tubes or you know something like that, and I don't want to be somebody who stands up and says, oh, my goodness, I invented the Internet and, and, and all the rest. What I have particularly savored about the chance to work on these issues, and I kind of look back at this period back when we started, I had a full head of hair and rugged good looks and, you know, all that, is that those of us who could be part of the foundation – Part of this kind of juggernaut, the groups that Jerry and Danny had, the 80 groups and all the stakeholders, this um, coalition that spans party and I ideology has been some of the most satisfying work I've been able uh, to be part of. It gives us a foundation to strengthen America's economic future in the decades uh, ahead. I'm going to try to come back. Uh, I don't know exactly about my – my, my prospects, but enjoy this meeting. We've done a lot of interesting sessions at the Internet Caucus since we founded it uh, years ago. This is one to really savor because it's a success story. This is one that a lot of people, even in the audience, uh, had a chance to, uh, to participate, and these folks are the special people uh, who made it happen, and I'm glad that I could play a, a little role in the whole kind of effort. Thanks for having me, everybody. Let me...
Let me say a couple of things just to emphasize what I think is important here. And then we can come back and talk about the nuts and bolts of Section 230. Senator Wyden was very generous to me and to Danny and to the stakeholders. But one of the big takeaways from the battle over 230 was that it was a real coalition effort. It was conservatives, liberals, civil libertarians, Prodigy, AOL, Microsoft. I could go copies of some of them don't even exist anymore. But it was the computer industry standing together and saying we have to, boy, we have a big education job to do. If we're going to get the policy right, including protecting kids as well as free speech, we can't let Congress have this view that this is a new, that this isn't a new medium that spans the globe. So we needed to, it was the first effort to educate the Congress about the new medium. And what the end of the story is that in conference, Section 230 passed overwhelmingly in the House, 414 to 4. It didn't pass Exxon. It passed this different vision, decentralized, user-controlled vision. In conference, Exxon prevailed. The conservative, social conservatives and people concerned about pornography and not the Internet wanted to work very hard, and we were overwhelmed in the conference. So what was interesting, we tried to substitute a narrower standard called harmful to minors for indecency. That failed. We did move enforcement to the Justice Department, but the most important thing is that Section 230 stayed in. When you read the bill as passed by in February, the Telecommunications Act in February of 1996, it makes no sense because 230 was designed as a substitute for Exxon. So it says nothing in this section has anything to do with Section 223, which then was Exxon. So that required the whole coalition to get together and challenge the statute. As everyone knows, the ACLU went into court in ACLU v. Reno and said this statute is unconstitutional, the indecency provision, because it's overbroad and vague. We filed a second lawsuit right behind them called ALA v. Reno, made up of CDT and AOL and Prodigy and CompuServe, a very different challenge. We went in to make the argument that's embodied in Section 230 that the least restrictive way and the most effective way in a global medium to protect kids is to focus on user empowerment and those tools. And to demonstrate those tools, we wired the court in Philadelphia. We made a very serious case with Jenner and Block as our attorneys and took a lot of the study that we had done together and made that part of our challenge. And when the Supreme Court came down, you will see that they do say the indecency standard is very vague, but the least restrictive means test, which some civil libertarians didn't like because it encouraged good Samaritans and private filtering, which to some was the burning of cyberspace, that was the hook on which the court decided the case. And so June 26, 1997, when the court struck it down, Exxon was gone and Section 230 was there. And in my view, what had started out as the Communications Decency Act became the Communications Democracy Act. And it's on that foundation that we've gone forward. And I'd really, at this point, you know, credit everyone who's here because you all worked on it in some way. And it was an important point. And it says we've got to educate. We've got to do that together. And I'd like to turn to Todd, who can talk about some of the operation of 230 over time and how it's impacted liability and intermediaries. And then Danny, who was there and is now Deputy Chief Technology Officer of the White House, can perhaps take us through the global situation and how 230 plays a part in the need to develop a technology architecture or policy architecture that promotes freedom globally. Todd? I always find 230 very interesting 
and very helpful for our company and for the um, eventual development of the Internet because of what it really says, right? I mean, the title itself is not about the Communications Democracy Act. The, the title is Protection for Private Blocking and Screening of Offensive Materials. And the provision really has turned out to be for many companies and for many others the Good Samaritan provision that was so important for what we think is really the development of a lot of responsibility and people taking steps to make the Internet not necessarily um, restricted, but much more able to grow in a healthy way. So, for example, prior to the case law that was coming down, Stratton Oakmont, AOL, and the Prodigy cases were much more along the lines of because AOL would take actions and had actions in which they had restricted others from using their services, they were assuming liability, they were assuming duties of care, and therefore the better action for an interactive service provider to do at the time was to stick their head in the sand. And that sticking the head in the sand is where there was a significant concern, and if you go through the rest of 230, the provisions are really about how do you allow a company or an interactive computer service to go back and to actively get involved and try to stop bad things from happening. And that, therefore, this was a responsibility obligation that was being allowed rather than the reverse. And what we've seen since the development of that, we think that that Good Samaritan side of the equation has been remarkably helpful to allow companies and for other people to participate in which they are able to also eliminate portions of, of materials that they find offensive. And for our company, at least, it has given us the ability over time to really work with law enforcement, work with others to say these are where we want to draw the line, for, for example, offensive material, hate material, whether we can take down hate material or not as a private company, Section 230 in many ways gives us the right to do that. And that's not necessarily what's been thought of as we celebrate the 15 years of the CDA and the 15 years of Section 230. The other side of this that doesn't get discussed a lot and where I think there's been a significant pushback in courts and will continue to be a pushback is the liability exemption. And any liability exemption in which you say this group of people has no responsibility for materials that came across their services or their sites, they're not responsible for it. And what you have is in many instances aggrieved parties that have no remedies. They are, cannot find the original publisher of the material or the publisher of the material is, is unapproachable. It's already been out there, for example, in a, in a defamation situation where the harm has already occurred. And there's no way in which they can recover. And what we've done is we've allowed an interactive service provider to be able to be in a position where they could not assume liability for those, for those, those materials. That has meant that you will continuously be challenged in courts from very challenging situations in which people who have what appears on the face to be very good, colorable claims, and they won't be made whole. And therefore, you will continuously see, and we see this globally, a desire for courts to constantly limit and push back on what the liability exemptions mean. And so therefore, it's very important that we do recognize that you are going to have case law that will continue in which there will be many judges and courts that really try to limit and cabin the liability exemption that is found within 230. And 230 does stand out there as a way in which internationally we can say this is a model that works for a lot of other places and a lot of other people and does work. And finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the international piece and then turn it over to Danny who really understands it far more than I do. But the international piece of 230 has allowed us to go to places like India, to places like Australia, to places like China and South Korea and stand and say, this makes sense for the growth and the development of the Internet. And in most instances, we get significant support from policymakers who do understand that for their societies, for their countries, their economic growth is in many ways dependent upon what type of an Internet they create. And 230 is a pretty good start that has been in many ways um, emulated and copied around the world. So I want to turn it over to Danny for a little more on that issue. Thank you.
Thanks, uh, Todd, and thanks, Jerry, and thanks, Tim, for organizing. Um, it, it's it's a kind of extraordinary honor to to be here to have the chance to look back and and hear people's uh, reflections. Um, I, I I do want to say that there are uh, there are a couple of people actually who are missing who um, uh, unless they walked in uh, <laughs> but I don't think so um, uh, you know so many of you who who are here uh, uh, were were involved and critical back then there are a couple of people who were really a key part of the coalition that Jerry mentioned uh, uh, Jill Lesser and Bill Burrington uh, from from AOL really um, uh, Jill was first at People Four with Leslie and 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 then at AOL with Bill, um, uh, uh, in a certain way, uh, Gene Kimmelman and Mark Cooper, who Jerry and I worked with a lot in the consumer movement, I think brought a certain kind of a bridge from a uh, civil liberties perspective to a bit more of a consumer perspective about, and, and, and I think got us all to think about what was actually going to make a difference uh, for, for people, how was the environment that that, that this that this law was going to create or that, that whatever congressional actions were going to create, how would those affect consumer interest? And I think that was a really important part of the discussion. And then and then two people who were um, who have passed away, Judith Krug and Bruce Ennis, also just had you know huge, huge roles uh, in this and none of us and none of this would be here uh, without without the two of them. Um, the the one just uh, kind of personal thing I'll say um, I it may be my own limitations, but I have to say, when we were going through this, I certainly didn't have a clue that it was anywhere even 10% as important as it's become. Um, and I think that's a lesson for all of us to to realize that, you know, all these issues are still here. We are still shaping this environment. Um, uh, we have to, as the senator said, take it deadly seriously. Uh, we we could screw it up uh, if we're not careful. We could fail to act where we need to act uh, if we're not careful. Um, uh, but just kind of as a personal note, I hope as all of you, uh, particularly those of you who are younger than some of us, are working on whatever you're working on, you know, realize the importance of what you're doing because you're you're making every bit the same kind of contribution. We just did it earlier, uh, but it, it, it continues. Um, I was supposed to look kind of forward and out internationally, but I'm going to look back and domestically to start off just for a minute. Um, to the, the 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 figure in American history who I think was the first and in a lot of ways most important intermediary we had, Ben Franklin. Uh, ben Franklin, as you know, was um, the first postmaster of the United States. He was a newspaper publisher. He did an extraordinary uh, number of things. But he he, along with his fellow postmasters and 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 um, newspaper publishers, who were often one and the same, um, uh, were really the intermediaries uh, of their day and. I think Franklin, in particular, recognized the the need to build um, uh, a national system of newspapers and, more importantly, a national communication system through the post roads uh, that he was part of funding before the Constitution was written and that he got written into the Constitution. Um, it's the only piece of infrastructure in the Constitution uh, is, is, is a constitutional uh, uh, provision uh, to give the federal government explicit authority to create post roads for all you strict constructionists. You know, that's really in there. There's no, <laughs> no getting around it. I'm not looking at you, Adam. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think, it, I think it says something about his view of what it took to build a democracy and what it took to build uh, um, an economy. Uh, he said a wonderful thing. He was a printer. Uh, 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 it's where he made most of his money. Um, and he, uh, if you can believe it, uh, you know, the, the political environment then was actually probably every bit as contentious, if not more so, then as it was now. Um, and the kind of shrill uh, pamphlets that were printed and sent back and forth were regarded by many people as unseemly and uncivilized. And there was actually a lot of pressure on printers, including Franklin, uh, to control uh, what, was, what was said through this war of pamphlets. And so Franklin uh, wrote um, a piece called Apology for Printers. I want to just read you a couple sentences of it. He said, it is unreasonable to imagine that printers approve of everything that they print. It is likewise unreasonable, what some assert, that printers ought not to print anything that they disapprove of, since an end would thereby be to put to free writing, and the world would afterwards have nothing to read but what happened to be the opinions of printers. Uh, and I think that, in a lot of ways for us, is really uh, the, the, the lesson about 
about the environment that, that, that Section 230 uh, uh, sought to create. Um, we'll talk, I'm sure, about uh, some of the current questions about the roles of intermediaries. There's a lot of focus, uh, uh, not surprisingly, on intellectual property protection issues. But I think what Franklin shows us and what you heard from Todd, and if you look at the, the writings about 230, what you see is the, the broad impact that it has across all different kinds of communications, all different kinds of commercial activity, uh, all different kinds of information exchange. So there will always be tensions, as Todd points out, on the margins uh, probably about, about some of the, the – um, the intellectual property protection issues, but the but the foundation of 230, I would suggest to you, is is, is far broader than that. I want to pick up uh, where Senator Wyden left off um, with the shipping lanes of the 21st century. I think that what we certainly all saw when when we were working on these issues in the mid 90s was uh, tremendous interest from uh, many other countries uh, in how the U.S. was approaching the Internet environment, what kind of policy models we were creating. There was a very fruitful dialogue, I think, between the U.S. and Europe. Uh, Europe brought a lot of important perspectives, particularly on issues like child protection. Um, and um, I think that but, – but, but I think, as you all know, uh, there was a real sense in which the first decade or so of the Internet environment uh, really was characterized – by Ira Magaziner's bumper sticker, Hands Off the Net. Um, now, those of you who pay attention to the law know that that was actually never true. We passed 230, of course. Then a year or so later, we passed the DMCA. So we never had Hands Off the Net. But nevertheless, I think that around the world, um, uh, much as, as Todd described in the discussions of 230, around the world there was a, a, a commitment to the view um, that, uh, that we should take – the country should take a light-touch approach, and that's what would encourage uh, the development of the Internet environment. I think all of you who, who – um, work in the international environment or even in the domestic environment, recognize that the pure hands-off approach is, is pretty hard to sustain at the moment. Um, it was one thing to say hands-off something that seemed kind of like a curiosity, like a thing that was created in garages that was kind of a frill that was uh, um, off as sort of an interesting sideshow side in the communications environment to something that's now central to our communications. It's the central nervous system of so much of our, of our economic life, our political life, uh, et cetera. Um, we probably don't – not probably. We can't say hands off anymore. Um, uh, but I think what that recognition has done has, has been to bring a number of countries together to say how can we approach – uh, the engagement between law and the Internet smartly? How can we approach it so that we preserve the values that are inherent in 230, so that we preserve the kind of innovation that 230 enabled? Um, many of you know that uh, just uh, this June, uh, the organization, organization for Economic Cooperation and Development brought together 34 countries, plus uh, um, uh, some observers, uh, Egypt and South Africa, uh, to discuss Internet policymaking principles. And the result of that meeting was a communique uh, that, that set out, that, that indicated these 34 countries' commitment to, to a set of basic principles about how to approach Internet policymaking. Uh, they include uh, protection of the global free flow of information, promotion of the open distributed architecture of the Internet, uh, transparency, fair process and accountability, privacy protection, individual empowerment, uh, I think inspired very much by the, 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 the views from 230, uh, intellectual property protection, and limiting Internet uh, intermediary liability. There are some other principles as well, but those are the ones that are, that are, that are worth highlighting. So this was 34 countries agreeing to these, to these principles. Um, uh, the process at the OECD goes on for uh, another little bit, uh, but once these are finalized as what is called an OECD recommendation, they will be considered uh, to be the views of these 34 countries, and probably more importantly, uh, they will be part of uh, the entry conditions for new countries that come into the OECD. Uh, Russia is very interested in joining the OECD. Brazil, India, even China are, are, are talking about it. Um, uh, the OECD is kind of 
uh, a popular uh, seal of approval these days uh, for countries that want to show their, their, their solid investment environments, their good risks uh, from an economic perspective. They have enlightened social policies. Um, so, so the fact that, that we were able to get, with the help of many of you, uh, 34 countries committed to this view means that we have the potential to spread these views about how to ensure an open Internet globally uh, will continue to flourish. Um, I think that really at, at the heart, um, these, these principles uh, encompass a lot of the, the, the genius of 230. On the one hand, the view that we want to avoid regulation, particularly avoid traditional regulatory processes. Um, certainly as we in the Obama administration look at new Internet policy challenges like privacy and cybersecurity, other consumer protection issues, uh, we're, we're very aware of the need for strong legal protection for individuals who use the Internet, but also very aware that we, we need, where possible, to use uh, more nimble, flexible rulemaking processes than, than what we traditionally do in some of our traditional um, regulatory agencies. Some of you may have seen uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago the Health and Human Services um, <clears throat> uh, Agency uh, announced uh, an effort with um, uh, uh, personal health um, uh, records systems uh, and the Federal Trade Commission and privacy advocates all working together to close some very important gaps in privacy protection. Uh, uh, HIPAA, for a variety of odd reasons, doesn't cover uh, uh, personal health uh, information systems. Um, uh, HHS brought together that whole community and encouraged them to adopt a code of conduct that would extend uh, privacy protection to these new uh, health information systems, and the FTC will, will, will be able to enforce those, those commitments. We didn't have to go to Congress to change the law. We didn't have to go through a long, protracted regulatory process to get a rule change. Uh, um, uh, within a matter of months, we got commitment to a new set of rules, and I think very importantly, we also got a structure that was enforceable uh, by a terrific enforcement agency, the Federal Trade Commission. I think this is in many ways the spirit uh, of 230. Um, I think the spirit of 230 is also, as, as, as both Jerry and Todd said, about encouraging um, innovation, uh, encouraging responsible action by intermediaries in particular. Uh, you, all you have to do is look at the child protection uh, efforts over the years. Stephen's been a, a huge part of that. And, and what you see is the... the um, the triumph of, of, of an effort to encourage responsible behavior by a variety of parties in the online environment uh, and an extraordinary set of technological successes where um, when, when we started this discussion in the mid-90s, there was a lot of hand-wringing about whether you could ever um, uh, uh, construct filters that would be reliable, that would offer adequate protection. There was hand-wringing on the other side. Uh, Barry Steinhardt from the ACLU wrote a great report called Fahrenheit 451 that, the, that filters would somehow burn down uh, uh, the net. Um, well, I think you look at the environment today and what you see is an incredible variety of tools using some of the most innovative artificial intelligence technologies um, uh, that uh, – is that Barry calling? <laughs> 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 um, uh, uh, you know, you, you see because, because we made a choice to defer uh, um, uh, – to the responsible behavior of a number of parties in the Internet environment, what we got was an ongoing set of innovations that are providing child protection to the level that I don't think we ever would have had uh, from the regulatory process that would have arose out of CDT. But finally, I also want to say that, that, that 230, the genius of 230 was also to recognize that there was an important role for the rule of law. The other person who I should have mentioned who made a significant 230 contribution uh, was Becca Gould, um, uh, who, who was right in there uh, working for BSA and made sure that 230 had the intellectual property exception written into it uh, um, uh, on behalf of BSA and its members. Um, so, so with that, and then and with the subsequent passage, passage of the DMCA, what we also recognized in our Internet environment, uh, and there was a lot of contention about this at the time, but I think what we recognized was that we could have an environment where we had a rule of law that could, that could preserve the free flow of information uh, uh, nonetheless and enable intermediaries to function uh, responsibly. So I think Ben Franklin would have been really proud of, of, of all of our efforts 
on 230. I think it embodies a sense of volunteerism that, that, that Ben Franklin was about. He was the guy who created the first fire department, the first fire insurance company, public libraries, all kinds of things that are, that are critical institutions in our, in our society that are voluntary. Uh, but he also, uh, uh, you know, was a drafter of the Constitution and believed that we needed to live under the rule of law. And I think Section 230 uh, does that for us. So I'm looking forward to the chance to discuss with all of you. And, and thank Thanks again to, to Tim and to Jerry for organizing. Appreciate it. I think, Tim, are we open to questions? Um, if you feel like you've exhausted your comments, we can open open to questions and, 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 and hopefully the senator can come back. Oh, Leslie. So not to... Yes, Leslie Harris. I'm the president of CDT. Um, so um, not to uh, put a damper on, on the party. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, my sense is that we may have hit the high watermark with 230. And certainly Todd, who's, who, you know, and, and Danny, who joined me on sort of what's happening globally, um, you know, I'm seeing greater and greater demands for you know, sort of legal obligations on intermediaries. We're having a fight in Congress right now about greater, greater demands uh, on, on, on intermediaries. So on the one hand, um, to the extent Europe in its directives has a not as good, but Section 230-like, uh, we can all take credit for that and in a number of other places. Um, but I can think of no place that's celebrating except us. Uh, and so I, I'm fairly concerned about that. And I guess my question is, you know, is there, is there room for hope here? Are we, are we going to have to sort of like uh, uh, just say, okay, anything you want on copyright, but otherwise we've got uh, intermediary protections? Uh, you know, where, where are we going in the future? Because uh, I'm, about, I'm headed to a hate speech meeting in, in uh, London where they're going to say to me, you have takedown obligations for copyright and you don't have takedown obligations for hate speech. Um, so um, advice, thoughts about where we're going globally? So the question is, is there hope? Well, I guess the question is. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm trying to figure that out. <laughs> the question is, does anybody, more, is anybody more hopeful than I am about where I'm seeing globally? Okay. Well, let me let me let me give it to them because, um, uh, and perhaps you missed the title of this, which is celebrating 15 years of the legislation that saved the internet. But you know, with that said, if you know, I agreed to come under those conditions. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I think it's really important. I mean, the, the 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 precedents of law in the United States are are you know, there's a lot of space for intermediary protection. Uh, from liability of publishers on their networks. But when you go country by country, Danny and Todd, it doesn't look the same. I mean, intermediaries are, are put in the middle uh, to do exactly what Leslie says, which is to, to monitor content and otherwise face liability for defamation, hate speech, and so on. They just don't get this decentralized voluntary uh, model that, that, that we created, and I, I don't think we've exported it very well. Am I, you can tell me yes or no. I think we've exported it pretty well. I think that the hardest part is really what you mentioned about the, the general monitoring. So there's a generalized acceptance globally for a notice and takedown regime that you can, if you receive notice in the intellectual property sphere or in any of the areas and the, the whole spectrum of potential criminal and civil um, activities that, that, that harm people, notice and takedown works fairly effectively. The hardest part of all, though, is this, are the obligations for prospective, future, specific and generalized monitoring. How do you end up, once you've been put on notice about one item, how do you prevent future harm from occurring? And you're always confronted with, on the intermediary side, with the best filters you can write, 
there's always subject to, it's language in most instances, and language is subject to different interpretations. And you work with courts a lot of times to say, we really want you to understand that if you impose the obligation, which is to prevent any future harm, you will cripple the ability for that. And what you've really granted is to the party that's complaining, you've granted them an exclusion from anybody else ever using any content in the area. They get to, they get to be in the internet free zone for themselves, right? That we won't allow their items for sale, for example, in a trademark instance, can't be shown at all because the threat of there would be a mistake imposes so much potential liability in an injunction setting that you just say there's none at all. But as I said, filters become very, very hard to constantly maintain and adapt, and most courts are willing to, to listen to that. It costs a lot of money. I give the example of the uh, – we do take down in Germany, we take down um, anti-Semitic listings. And generally, every other week we'll get a list from the Central Committee of the Jewish Community in Berlin of new terms that are, that are anti-Semitic terms, and we'll run a filter – to try to have those um, taken out and, and do the best we can. And on a Thursday, we got a list, and our folks in Germany put in the filter Jude, J-U-D-E. And on Monday, someone walked in and said, over the weekend on our German site, every Jude Law film had been blocked. <laughs> and it's not a tragedy, right? <laughs> but no, there's some good Jude Law films. I disagree with that. <laughs> But that, that's the, the, the filtering that's, obligation and the, and the desire for people to say you can control your systems and therefore prevent future harm from occurring is really where I think the, the greatest challenge lies and where there are these – the examples are numerous and the harms are quite extensive that, that come from that. So uh, here's why I think we should all be hopeful, especially you, Leslie. Um, the – no, that's all right. Uh, 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 but I think I think the reason to be uh, being hopeful doesn't mean being naive, and it doesn't mean pretending that there are no problems because there certainly are significant challenges, and I expect there will continue to be significant challenges. But I think that if you if if you go back and think about where the whole idea of two thirty came from to begin with, I think it actually came from understanding how people who were operating internet and other online services at the time were functioning. It, 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 it wasn't a sort of a pie in the sky, oh, gee, if we did this, maybe we'd get an internet. It was more, how are we going to keep it? How, how, how can we approach these questions in a sensible way, given what we know from the people who were operating these systems, both from a business perspective and a technical perspective? And and the reason I think to be hopeful is because I think that the Internet is successfully spreading around the world. And um, whether it's just in a, in a, on a commercial basis, uh, whether it's, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, people in one country or another uh, after another who work for eBay or people who run competitors to eBay in other countries – they're in the same business that – they're in the same Internet business, and they have the same concerns, and, they're, and, and each country is going to go through this same discussion. But I think the reason to be hopeful is that, to a large extent, I think they're going to have to come to similar conclusions uh, if they want to keep this environment. If they don't, then, you know, then there are a lot of other things they could do. Uh, but, but, but I think that's a real um, – that is a, a genuinely felt imperative uh, um, in, in lots of places. Now, can I scare you again, though? Sure. Right. So the, one of the great concerns I think that we look at is really the, the change as to who the gatekeepers are, right? So that if the gatekeeper is the governments, in, some, in many places the gatekeepers are the governments, right? The, the Chinese Internet and the, the Great Wall does limit an enormous amount of content flowing into China. From our perspective, it's, it's many instances private entities – acting as gatekeepers and as platforms who have commercial interests in play throughout all the different parts of the Internet, through the application layers, through the network layers. And, and we see this in the mobile space. And Jerry was kind enough to send around an article this week. But at what point is there an obligation in which the commercial entities become utilities? 
And at what point, how do, and 230 doesn't do anything around, around this area, but it is something in which we all have collectively have a way in which we have to think about some of the issues that are driven by commercial gatekeepers, much more so than just government gatekeepers. Can, can I just make one comment? Sorry, let me go, go ahead. Hi, Steve DeLiango, Net Choice. Question for Todd. A kudos for the clarity of 230 where it says no provider shall be treated as a publisher or speaker of information provided by another. But despite the clarity, Net Choice has, has joined on a couple of amicus briefs where lower courts took it upon themselves to determine whether the platform was worthy or entitled to the protection. So the question would be, do you, do you feel that you have to work that out one case at a time or should Congress try to clarify to make what was clear, even clearer still. Well, I'm going to defer to Jerry. He no. has something to. Uh, um, I think it's really it, the, the statute is just fundamentally clear on its face that that you're not in the business. Of, the the courts are not in the business of choosing the right platform, even though it has that that parental control. Some courts have tried to read that as limiting it to only those efforts where you're trying to. Um, uh, protect kids from from indecent con content. Are you are you free from liability? But that's just not the way the statute was drafted or intended. It was really much broader than that. It was a substitute for Exxon, and it meant to deal with the Stratton uh, uh, Prodigy case, which which was holding them liable for for uh, defamation. And it was also to say that intermediaries were free to run their, their sites the way they wanted to. There was a theory of both the Good Samaritan, there's a tension always, for voluntary ordering. One was we really wanted to encourage Good Samaritan, it's a Good Samaritan statute, so that the private sector has to act responsibly and they can, you know, create the sites the way and their services they want to. The theory of freedom underlying that was one that the government wasn't doing it. But the second was, at the time, we were talking about multiple ISPs where s users would have a choice between going, there would always be another space that could be organized in a different way. There might be the prodigy for really family-friendly. There would be AOL, which would be a little more uh, adult, and then maybe a wide-open ISP. And that was the, the freedom of free speech of multiple ISPs. I don't know whether, Todd, you were going to the utility question. I mean, when some of these, um, uh, our platforms, they achieve enormous market power and where 800 million people are on Facebook and they, they begin to dominate the space, the question is whether the government then, and as filtering technology becomes more, more uh, robust, some of the arguments that we made that you can't filter and so uh, the, the intermediaries wouldn't know what was on their site. That whole regime or argument begins to, to look a little shaky so that it, a, a government that, that moved into this space might be able to take apart the, 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 the fundamental theory behind 230. How's that for good news? Um, <laughs> Just reminding everybody. <laughs> um, picking up a little bit on what was said, uh, Ed Black, Computer Communications Industry Association. Um, as I guess I look at the world, I really see kind of, if you will, a, a global competition for two models of Internet. One, which I think 230 is symbolic of, is an open, uh, a maximally possible open Internet. And you have, let's say, the Chinese model. And countries around the world are looking both from a political, cultural, and economic focus, which is best. What I think is most troubling to me right now is, A, I mean, that, that's a tough battle, and we may not be winning in a lot of countries. And I think the State Department, and among others, gets great credit for being out there forcefully in the right direction. But that there are things going on in the U.S. government that are sending the contrary signal. And, and we have uh, I'll talk about protect, protect IP. And I've not seen a clear denunciation of some of the negative impacts that would have on an open Internet out of an administration, which frankly campaigned on a very great Internet platform. Um, and we would like to think that that competition, uh, that our side is in fact consistently forceful for an open uh, Internet. And in various international fora, 
USTR and others are not as strong as uh, at all as we'd like. And if you, I know, Danny, I, you've done a great job at put you on the spot. But the truth is, on a lot of these issues, the administration does not seem to speak with a single strong voice. Is that a question? Is there a question there? Well, question is yes. And can we expect a, a more forceful voice pro-Internet, open Internet from the administration? Uh, I think you could, could you could expect a continued strong voice for an open internet uh, that that balances openness and rule of law. That's what I think that that is guided by what our legal foundations are by 230, by DMCA, and 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 by the very idea that's in 230 that we do in certain cases look to intermediaries to service providers. Uh, to take voluntary actions, uh, um, obviously in a, in, a, in a transparent due process context. Um, I think that's what you can expect, and I think that's what you see us advocating in the OECD. That's what you see us advocating uh, in, in a number of trade discussions. There's, I think, a very important discussion going on in the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, discussion. Um, you know, if for, for those who want to think that 230 is the beginning and end of Internet policy, um, I, I think that's just an ahistoric view. Uh, um, you know, 18 months later, or whatever the exact number of months is, uh, uh, we, we passed a DMCA. And um, I think that we, we continue to look at, at how, to, how to strike that balance properly. And, and I think that most importantly, most importantly, uh, our, thank you, Tim. Um, I think most importantly, what, what the experience that we've had over the last 15 years shows is that we can is that the combination of those two works well. Uh, that that we don't have to back away from intellectual property protection in order to have an open internet environment. Uh, uh, I just I, I I think that any you know you, you can't say 230 is great for the internet, uh, uh, but somehow DMCA is a problem. Um, uh, because we've had them both, um, and and I think what we've what we've ha what we've seen is a system where we've kind of worked out the a lot of the difficult issues, and we'll continue to work out the difficult issues on the margin of of where liability limitation starts and ends, and how to handle um, uh, uh, notice and take down regimes in a in a responsible way. I think that's always going to be with us in large part because, as Todd said, the platforms are going to keep changing. The platforms that we're focused on are. Are, are no longer, as Jerry said, just the ISPs. Uh, there's all kinds of other intermediaries in the intermediate spaces. <laughs> and and uh, so we're going we're gonna to have to keep reinterpreting, kind of to Steve's point, what, what it means to have no liability, um, uh, depending, on, depending on where you sit. All right, well, but, um, but I think we're heading in, in, in a very positive direction, and I think we're, 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 we're setting the right kind of example around the world. I have three questions back here, and hopefully some of them will be more in the celebratory vein. Uh, <laughs> I should have got a I should have got a cake with 15 candles on it to mark. Uh, <laughs> if it was all celebratory, everyone would be on be unemployed in this room. I mean, that's a, Could I lead us in a rousing rendition of "Cool in the Gang" celebration, Tim? <laughs> be helpful. Hi, Adam. Uh, hi, I'm Adam Thier with uh, the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Um, so, Danny, your your point about DMCA and it's sort of the notice and takedown model that was my question, which is. There's an attack underway from a lot of academics these days on 230. Uh, if you read a book like The Offense of Internet, which came out earlier this year, a collection of essays, which was basically almost sort of an anti-230 jihad, if you will. I mean, every essay was saying, we've got to do something about 230. And it was really interesting because the grounds that, of the attack were much more focused on privacy, reputation, and anonymity. And we haven't heard a lot of talk about that today, but we're starting to see models come out of the academy for a modified DMCA-like notice and takedown regime based upon those concerns. Um, we see this tension manifest itself in legislation, you know, things like eraser buttons and other affirmative obligations on intermediaries to take down certain types of content on reputational grounds. How do you balance that tension? I, I know this is an important priority for the Obama administration, so there's clearly a tension here. You know, I, I, I don't know... I don't know how much – I mean, one could certainly speculate in an academic sense about, about how to apply a notice and takedown model to, to, to consumer privacy protection. It's not the approach that we're looking to. The approach that we're looking to is based on 
you know, very well established fair information practice principles applied um, in kind of the current uh, internet environment with an emphasis actually on a lot of the affirmative 230 principles with an emphasis on individual empowerment, um, uh, making sure that, that, that people have tools to control um, uh, how their information is used and, and, and where it's used and making sure that there are accountability mechanisms in, mechanisms, uh, in place. Um, you know, I think if you look at the role of, of, of intermediaries in privacy protection, um, it's a, uh, for the most part, a relatively uh, uh, bright line. Um, I mean, intermediaries don't have a lot of choice, for example, about whether they uh, comply with a law enforcement uh, uh, electronic surveillance order or not. They do it or not based on, uh, you know, based on what the, what the substantive privacy law uh, requires. Um, so I think, I think the privacy question is really important. I, I, I think it's tempting to, to look to the DMCA model, um, but I don't, this is just a personal statement, I don't think that, um, I don't think that our First Amendment uh, is all that friendly to the idea that all personal information is property. Uh, and I think you'd have to go in that direction. And I just, I don't, I don't think that, I don't think that's where the, the mainstream of the privacy community, whether the advocates or the, uh, the commercial entities are really thinking. Hi, uh, Tim Sparapani. Um, I, I was, Danny, you actually anticipated my question. I was going to ask whether we needed a 230-like provision to protect apps and, more importantly, platforms from the failure of apps to uh, utilize common sense privacy principles or security. So here's the scenario we've seen over and over again. Uh, platform puts out a, a set of principles, an app goes ahead and uses data they shouldn't use or they, they create a vulnerability that they should have probably addressed. Somebody finds out. The plaintiff's bar turns around and sues the platform. Uh, the platform turns around and says to the app uh, industry, you've got to do X, Y, and Z in the future. Somebody fails to do it. Shouldn't we protect the platforms who have suggested uh, some provisions that should be followed by apps in order to continue to make those intermediaries strong and stronger in the future? Um. I guess I think what we should be clear on is what the privacy obligations of all of those parties are. Um, our, our work on privacy, um, and, and, I, and what I think um, is a lot of the FTC's work on privacy, is, is aimed at the substantive questions of what should be the obligations of those who handle personal information. Um, I'm sure there's at some point along the way a 230 angle as between apps and platforms, uh, it's an interesting issue. But I, I guess I think the overriding question is, is what, are the, what are the privacy obligations of those different parties? I think we have to sort that out first, really. Um, uh, and that's obviously happening to some, some extent through, through private rela con contractual relationships between the platforms and the apps. But uh, you know, our view is that we need um, better guidance in the form of enforceable codes of conduct and we hope ultimately a statute that would clarify obligations. I think that would would reduce the the friction or the confusion, whatever it is, but that you're hypothesizing between apps and and, and, and platforms. Uh, we have a question here. And Danny, if I don't mention it later, I do appreciate you coming to talk about the history and the origin of Section 230. <laughs> Thank you so much for playing. Um, another question? Yeah, Juliana with National Journal. Do you see any similarities between what you, you know, the fights you faced in the 90s that led to 230 and the calls by IP owners to require third parties to take additional actions to combat online piracy? You know, some of the things that are in the Protect IP Act. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, you can ask me more questions. <laughs> A question, if I may, um, and it was kind of inspired by Adam Thayer's Dr. Spock look um, when he was went to an alternative universe. Just bear with me here. Let's just say, let's just say there were two universes, and uh, one Congress in one universe and another Congress in another universe. One passed uh, the Communications Decency Act, the Exxon Amendment, 
uh, one passed Section 230, the Internet Freedom and Family Empowerment Act, uh, Senator Wyden, Senator Co- I mean, Congressman Wyden, Congressman Cobb. We just told that story, exactly but what let's happened. Just, and let's just say in the, in the universe that had um, Senator Exxon's amendment, the Supreme Court uh, found that it didn't violate the First Amendment. Uh, Reno wins over ACLU. Which statute, given uh, their attempts to protect children, which in their entirety, which statute do you think would be more effective at protecting children, given the entirety of what we know now? <laughs> well, all, it seems to me that all we know is the world, the world where 230 prevailed, and and I think that we have a very robust child protection environment online thanks to a whole number of factors. Um, could there have been a better result if we had a, uh, a kind of indecency regulatory regime? Um, I guess I think you can look at television over the last 20 years and wonder about whether that's a good model <laughs> uh, if your concern is to somehow protect kids against indecency. Um, but that's about as far as I'm willing to go with the hypothetical. The, the answer is I think you probably could have a much more child-friendly Internet, but then you wouldn't have the Internet because it would, it, it would be – there would be – speech would be chilled across all of these platforms to make it look like television and have no malfunctions, no seven dirty words anywhere on the Internet, goodbye to the blogosphere, um, a lot of chilling speech on all intermediaries. It would have just been an alternative – wasteland, and the Internet would have been stifled. Thanks. Stephen Balkan with the Family Online Safety Institute. Jerry, you and I both testified at the first Senate Judiciary hearing on basically porn and the Internet. So two things to celebrate. One was... Thank you. We got out of the... Yeah, 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 yeah. We survived Senator Grassley. Well, we first of all, we survived, so there's three things to celebrate. Um, the second was that at the time, the only so-called study or research was the dreadful RIM study, which, of course, led to the front page of the, uh, the front cover of Time and so on. And that's what the conversation was based on. And so something to celebrate, first of all, is the emergence of folks like Pew and uh, Sonia Livingston in the EU, and there's an incredible body of really good academic research. More is coming out all the time that we can now use when we're up here on the Hill or we're in Parliament or whatever. Um, the second thing I, I recall from that day was how the senators were falling over themselves to declare themselves computer illiterate, illiterate, apart from Pat Leahy, who by that time, in amazingly in 1995, had already held his first electronic town hall meeting. But the others were saying, oh, I've never even seen a website. You know, my staff do all my email for me. What is email? You know, stuff like this. So those are three things to celebrate. Um, so I've done the celebration. Now I do have a, a kind of a question that goes back to Leslie's original uh, concerns. We, we're seeing the ITU uh, with their Child Online Protection Initiative um, trying to dr- drum up support internationally, particularly in developing countries, for a very top-down codes of conduct industry, you will do this approach. Um, and at the same time, from the EU, Nelly Cruz, who's the commissioner for the digital agenda, has rather surprisingly come up with uh, a range of things that she wants to see industry do in the next six to nine months, including rating systems for the Internet, right. um, and with various ideas that have long ago been seen to be not very helpful. And if industry doesn't do it, then we will legislate. So your comments on that. Well, my comments on that is, is what I said after Senator Wyden left, that I don't think we've improved on the model of what allows us to keep free and balance these interests out. It was enormous cooperation between the the Internet community, intermediaries, the civil liberties groups, the, the civil – and even um, efforts to educate each other. The COPA Commission, which came after, uh, brought all the family groups together, and there was a great dialogue, and, and the result of that was a decision that, that we really – education was the way to go, and we shouldn't pass – another um, overriding governmental regulation that that wasn't going to work. That educational process, that dialogue process, which I think continues in the United States, I know CDT, not to to push our agenda, but has been – 
to try and move that kind of continuing dialogue globally. And that's always been a struggle, which is to – we don't have a strong uh, a NGO sector in uh, – around the world. Uh, and I don't think we uh, – Leslie can speak to this. It's the – does the industry and the academics and people come together and say, let's try and find – the most effective way to protect kids in the least restrictive way and protect speech. That's, that's, a, that's a cooperative effort. And, and I don't think without that cooperative private stakeholder effort that Danny Weissner or any government agency is going to, do, is going to be in a position to do the right thing. It's, it, it needs that push. It needs someone to say the tools are effective or they may not be as effective as, as you'd like them to be, but we can do better. Or here's how we're doing it, and here's what's around the corner. Uh, that work, one of the, the, the ironies of 230 is it, is it kind of says you can go to sleep until some crisis happens because you're not going to be liable. That wasn't the intent of the statute. It was a good Samaritan statute that said work to balance these things out and continue the dialogue. And I, uh, one other person who's missing today is Ron Plesser. He was always in that room working with us. Uh, to try and industry and, and, and civil society and civil liberties organization to work those solutions out. So if there's a multi-stakeholder process, Danny certainly needs it, and we ought to be doing it, and we try to do it. Yeah, Bruce McCauley. Um, Tim, first of all, uh, before I get into the question, I'll apologize for focusing more on the hangover than the celebration. But uh, it, it occurs to me um, the open Internet is a uh, nice rhetoric, but there was a time in history when open sewers were considered uh, acceptable practices. I work in IT security, and I have to deal with the downside of that. It seems to me that with the uh, focus on uh, liability and uh, promoting the development of um, these, these services that we haven't at the same time focused on accountability. And that's another problem with the, with the whole privacy area. Specifically, in a lot of the legislation, commercial interests have worked hard to ensure that there are legal protections to keep their products and their commercial interests as opaque as possible and to punish researchers by prohibiting third-party reverse engineering investigation of, of security issues. And the question that I have, and, and this is specifically motivated this morning on Facebook, Sophos was talking about a um, individual in Australia that uh, found a problem, a security issue with the financial firm holding his accounts for reporting it their legal folks are attacking him. He's basically being punished for doing a good thing. And the question I have is, do you see a possibility or a need for some kind of safe harbor or whistleblower protection for outsiders that investigate and practice responsible disclosure about security problems? Because those otherwise are causing harm to individuals and the current legal structure actually protects the interests that are responsible for that harm, even though they don't bear any, respond, any uh, consequences of it. it I, would, I would answer. I, I, I think it's, it's – you want to try it, Tom? No. Uh, <laughs> my answer is that the – the, the intention of the, the researcher to reverse engineer and figure out the hole in the system is, is, is noble. The question is trying to sit down and figure out how you would define that into legislation where you're, where you're defining the good guy versus the hacker and the reverse engineer who's trying to end your privacy um, would be almost a very, very difficult exercise. Uh, I, I think it's almost – Impossible to do. Um, let, me just, let me just go to one more question. Um, Leslie, you want to go? Thank you. Steve Metalitz. Uh, I want to compliment the panel. This is an excellent panel, and 
the fact that none of you look a day older than you did 15 years ago is further testament to the power of Section 230. Um, I'd like to celebrate uh, an aspect of Section 230 that actually Danny mentioned, um, but some other folks in the room maybe aren't so happy about, and that is the exceptions to Section 230. Section 230E, uh, which include uh, that it has no effect on prosecution of federal criminal law, it has no effect on the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, and my personal favorite, it has no effect on intellectual property law. Let me ask if, you, looking back, do you think that we, had, we got the right exceptions in the law in 1996? Were there some others that should have gone in there? And really going back to what Todd said, uh, if there had been more exceptions, would that have perhaps relieved some of the pressure the courts obviously feel to construe the basic liability limitation in Section 230 as narrowly as possible? So uh, full disclosure, in the 96, during the uh, – during the, the CDA debate, um, I was an outside attorney for the Business Software Alliance, so I was a supporter at the time of the uh, of the IP provision and appreciate what Becca did. Um, and, and I think it goes to the point in which there were other federal statutes that were in the midst of being developed or were currently in there, and it was it was a it is a it is an okay place to separate out different types of liability for different types of acts and, and ways in which they get um, apportioned. And you see the difference being in the European model with an e-commerce directive, which is a horizontal directive and applies to everything, and then you have a constant pushback in which you get the um, IPRED to and the, the copyright directive and the software directive. And so it continuously comes up, and there's lots of different places in which you're going to see different, slightly different liability regimes. And I think that makes sense because there are different expectations and different obligations that should attach for different types of activities. So the spectrum is, right, I mean, the spectrum was protecting children, in most instances, is probably going to be higher on the society value than necessarily how we handle Internet gambling, right, even though that's one in which there's a pretty strict and stringent regime for intermediaries with Internet gambling. So I always think you should go back and look at who, and it goes to Tim's point earlier about who should carry the liability in many instances, because not just how do they benefit from it, are they in a position to stop or prevent the harm that we generally recognize as a harm? If you go from that point of view, you know, a lot of times the, 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 the outcomes that governments are able to put together work. I mean, there's a reason why 15 years later we haven't overturned the CDA. Right. I mean, the CDA itself was, but Section 230 has survived. There's a reason why 12, 13 years later, the DMCA is basically still intact, right? And the e-commerce directive is still intact in Europe, and the, the copyright directive is still intact. They seem to be working in most instances, and that tension that is going to constantly be there from interested parties that have valid interests are really what governments and policymakers have to confront and it's going to be continuously challenged. So I'm still on the optimistic side that governments do a pretty good job here with the private sector and, and everyone in the room activity to continuously press the issues in all the forum that we all deal with. Just politically, I mean, we could probably think of other exceptions that one could work with, but it's also who's in the room and what was intended. I mean, the, the copyright industry is there to protect its interests, we were trying to get Section 230 through, whether it was, you know, totally, uh, you know, a perfect statute. I don't know. We had two, but two big issues was to, was to create a regime for intermediate information service providers. And at the same time, not to affect, and this is was talking with David Sohn the other day, telecommunications providers. We were not trying to deal with common carriage. We were trying to deal with people who were providing information services, and it was the, you know, the, the scalpels in the room were working on that regime. If someone wants to create an exception, what, what you have to have a coalition. You have to put together a pretty good argument for it. You need to develop a regime that makes it work for everyone as, as reasonably as possible. That's what the DMCA did in the copyright area. We haven't gotten any um, additions to that because that coalition hasn't come together. 
Can I just make one? I think it's an interesting question, Stephen. Just one observation about the world in which that whole the whole statue was written. Interestingly, it was a world that was much more about, if I could say, pure speech. So the as you remember, the, 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 the liability issues that were really front and center on the table were defamation issues and maybe other kinds of more speech-related uh, uh, liability. I don't think that um, – I certainly didn't have in my mind, I don't think we had in, in our mind, um, a sense of the amount of commerce and commercial activity that would be happening in these environments. Um, so I think that tells you something about where the – Statute was focused and where the exceptions were focused. Um, we weren't thinking guys, about when eBay. When did eBay started? What year? Uh, September 95. We didn't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> Nor did I at the time. <laughs> right. Right. Well, uh, maybe so, with the that. The reason we did such a good job is we didn't know very much about what we were doing. <laughs> I don't want to. I think we did. Well, let, let, me, let me just say um, I, I was in no way, shape, or form responsible for the creation or passage of Section 230 in any way. But I'm really humbled um, to hear the perspectives of the people that were there then. I'm also humbled uh, to hear about people we've lost, like Ron Plesser and Bruce Ennis and, and Judith Krug, um, who are real heroes in my mind. Um, but I, I'm glad we were able to blow out the candles, even if the hangover started a little bit early, um, because I think it's an astoundingly sublime statute. Um, and I also appreciate Danny's comment that um, he only appreciated maybe 10 percent or 20 percent of the actual import of the thing as, as they were moving through it. And, and Jerry says the good thing was we didn't know enough. But um, I, I really thank everybody for sharing their perspectives on this. Senator Wyden, the, car, the Congressional Internet Caucus co-chairs, Congressman Goodlatte, Congresswoman Eshoo, Senator Leahy, and Senator Thune for, for co-hosting with us. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Can I make one last comment? Last <laughs> comment. No, just one. Thank Tim. And realize that the Internet Caucus was created and the Internet Education was directly out of this experience. Thank to you. say, let's educate each other and the Congress before, wherever you are on the issues, try to understand the technology before you act. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for playing, gentlemen. Thank you.